So content warning here. He's about to get very racist. So, free talk. Um, can I say it? Had a five act structure. No objections. <sighs> he made a five act structure like this. It, it, Mr. English, Mr. English, me, me. Uh, that's Closer to Kenneth Rowe from 1939. Fine, fine. Let's see his book. The diagram looks like this. Now he talked about conflict. It, it, Mr. English, Mr. English. Uh, he talked about conflict. Contrasting emotions as the center of place? How am I supposed to teach this class when you keep trying to correct me? Mr. English, you need help? 안녕하세요, Kim Yunmi입니다. Hello, I'm Yunmi Kim, your fantastic but not quite all knowing guide to world literature. Gustav Freitag gets his own episode because later people reference him with things that he never said. Some historical context. At the time, it was popular to look back on the classics. So, for example, Aristotle and Shakespeare. This text does this a lot. Oh yeah, John Ruskin. Yes. He also liked to look back on the classics for his pre-Raphaelite movement. Freytag was no different. The problem is that while he cites Shakespeare and Aristotle, he gets them wrong. Oh, is that a theme of the series? Yes, it is. He inserts his own ego and says that he could do it better. Oh, he did believe in the realism movement, but mostly it was because he supported the middle class. But let's go over his famous proposed act structure. No, 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 not that one. That one's wrong. I'm sorry. Don't know what I was thinking. Yes, I know that this act structure is in several places, but it's completely wrong. This is not what he drew in his book. Let's be straight here. No one uses his act structure. No one. The only person that ever used his act structure is him because he was retconned to hell. Yes, that one is better. This is the one that he drew in his book on page 115 of this techniques, this dramas. And I have a screen cap of the page, just in case you don't believe me. So Freytag argued for an exciting force. This was made through emotional contrast, such as happy scene, sad scene, happy scene, sad scene. His theory was that it would make the happier scenes even happier, and the sad scenes even suffer. So the rise in his diagram would go up. The exciting force, the beginning of the excited action, complication, occurs at a point where in the soul of the hero, there arises a feeling or volition, which becomes the occasion of what follows, or where the counterplay resolves to use its level to set the hero in motion. Manifestly, 
this impelling force will come forward more significantly in those plays which the chief ac actor governs the first half by his force of will. But in any arrangement, it remains an important motive force for the action. In Julius Caesar, this is impelling force is the thought of killing Caesar, which by the conversation with Cassius gradually becomes fixed in the soul of Brutus. In Othello, it comes into the play after the stormy night scene of the exposition by means of the second conference between Iago and Rodrigo with the agreement to separate the Moor and Desmana. In Richard III, on the contrary, it rises in the very beginning of the piece along with the exposition and as a matured plan in the soul of the hero. Gustav Freitag, Die Technik des Dramas, page 121. While the Greek stage was the following bit can be somewhat equated to the inciting incident, but you'll notice that it's not exactly the same. When at a certain point in the action, there enters suddenly, unexpectedly, in contrast with what has preceded, something sad, somber, frightful, that we yet immediately feel has developed from the original course of events and is perfectly intelligible from the presuppositions of the play. This new element is a tragic force or motive. This tragic force must possess the three following qualities. 1. It must be important and of serious consequence to the hero. 2. It must occur unexpectedly. 3. It must, to the mind of the spectator, stand in a visible chain of accessory representations in rational connection with the earlier parts of the action. Gustav Freitag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 94 to 95. The next step in his diagram is called the rise, or the rising movement. The rising movement. The action has been started. The chief persons have shown what they are. The interest has been awakened. Mood, passion, and volition have received an impulse in a given direction. In the modern drama of three hours, there are no insignificant parts which belongs to this ascent. Gustav Freitag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 125. The next part is called the climax. This is probably equated to the midpoint in the current formula. The climax. The climax of the drama is the place in the piece where the results of the rising movement come out strongly and decisively. It is almost always the crowning point of a great amplified scene, enclosed by the smaller connecting scenes of the rising and of the falling action. Gustav Freitag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 128. See, the thing is that the thing that he labels the climax is not what we think of the climax because he says 
The most difficult part of the drama is the sequence of scenes in the downward movement, or as if may well be called, the return, especially in the powerful plays in which the heroes are the directing force do these dangers enter most. Up to the climax, the interest has been firmly fixed in the direction in which the chief characters are moving. After the deed is consummated, a pause ensues. Suspense must now be excited in what is new. For this, new forces, perhaps new roles must be introduced in which the hearer is to acquire interest. On account of this, there is already danger and distraction and the breaking up of scenic effects. And yet, it must be added, the hostility of the counterparty towards the hero cannot always be easily concentrated in one person, nor in one situation. Sometimes it is necessary to show how frequently, now and again, it beats upon the soul of the hero, and in this way, in contrast with the unity and firm advance of the first half of the play, the second may be ruptured in many parts, restless. This is particularly the case with historical subjects, where it is most difficult to compose the counterparty of a few characters only. And yet the return demands a strong bringing out and intensifying of the scenic effects on account of the satisfaction already accorded the hearer and on account of the greater significance of the struggle. Gustav Freitag, Des Techniques de Dramas, page 133. Downward Movement, Definition and Reason for Existence. And the last thing is the catastrophe for which he says, the catastrophe. The catastrophe of the drama is the closing action. It is what the ancient stage called the exodus. In it, the embarrassment of the chief characters is relieved through a great deed. The more profound the strife which has phoned forward in the hero's soul, the more noble its purpose has been. So much more logical will the destruction of the succumbing hero be. And warning must be given here that the poet should not allow himself to be misled by modern tenderheartedness to spare the life of his hero on the stage. Gustav Freitag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 137. Okay, it seems like we're done. No, I have to explain why he had these ideas, which is later in the book. Ah, oh, damn it. <sighs> Got me again. Okay, let's warm this up. Gustav Freitag. It's clear he got his ideas from other places, but he doesn't give credit to any of them. They are not original. He only credits those whom he deemed worthy. Oh, this is a problem with later writing advice books, but hang on, we'll get there soon. A note to the watchers out there that do not know me, I am Jewish. So Gustav Freitag reminds me of all of those imperialistic donkeys who wrote around the turn of the 20th century that I had to read for my anthropology degree. And I was not thrilled. Because they said racist stuff. You are warned. Some basic thoughts he had about story. Concerning the artless treatment of historical material through the epic traditions of our old stage, Shakespeare, above all others, have given hints to the Germans. His historic plays taken from English history, the structure of which, except Richard II, we should not imitate, 
had a far different justification. At that time, there was no writing of history as we understand the term, and as the poet made use of material from historic resources for his artistic figures, he wrought from an abundance and opened up the immediate past to his nation in a multitude of masterly character sketches. But he himself achieved for the stage of his time the wonderful advance to a complete action, and we owe to him after he began to make use of the material in Italian novels, our comprehension of how irreplaceable the noble effects are, which are produced by a unified and well-ordered action. His Roman plays, if one makes allowance for a few of the practices of his stage and third action of Antony and Cleopatra, are models of an established construction we do not do well to imitate what he has overcome. Gustav Freytag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 41. Oh, God. No, no. Shakespeare did not know that you existed, Gustav Freytag. Oh, you vey. No, if you watched the last episode, Shakespeare did not invent histories. There are plenty of surrounding texts that cover histories, which would later become historical fiction, but he was the first to make a sustained number of them. This was said by Andrew Hadfield, University of Sussex, in British History's Biggest Fibs with Lucy Worsley, Episode 1, War of the Roses. I seem to remember there was some guy named Christopher Marlowe or something who made Dido, Queen of Carthage. Maybe Shakespeare didn't invent the genre. Oh my god! Maybe he didn't! A well-ordered action was also not invented by Shakespeare. Because that was Aristotle. Oh! He said that really long quote about beginning, middle, and end. And it has to be continuous, no skipping around. Also in the series, I seem to remember something about last episode I said what was I think it? that we can sum this up quickly William Shakespeare did not invent the five act structure okay we're done oh yeah Shakespeare did not invent the five act structure oh wow it was imposed after his death so indeed what did Shakespeare overcome Freytag, I want to know. Did he come back as a vampire and restructure his place? Tell me. If he did come back as a vampire to restructure his place, then he would have been stabbed in the heart. Oh, and you might think this is a minor error on Freytag's part, but no, he keeps warping facts to suit his purposes, like this. On the other hand, there was the fact of the ancient tragedy, only imperfectly developed, which is indispensable to our tragedy. The dramatic ideas and actions of the Greeks lacked a rational conformity to the laws of nature. That is, such a connecting of events as would be perfectly accounted for by the disposition and one-sidedness of the characters. We have become free men. We recognize no fate on the stage, but such as proceeds from the nature of the hero himself. The modern poet has to prepare the hearer, the proud joy that the world into which he introduces him corresponds throughout to the ideal demands which the heart and judgment of the hearer set up in comparison with the events of reality. Human reason appears in the new drama as agreeing with and identical with divine. 
it remodels all that is incomprehensible in the order of nature according to the needs of our spirit and heart. This particularity of the action specially strengthens for the spectator of the best modern plays, beautiful transparency and joyous elevation. It helps to make himself for ours stronger, nobler, freer. Gustav Freytag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 90. And if that's not enough, then there's this fanciful quote like this. While the Greek stage was developed out of a lyric representation of passionate emotions, the German has arisen from the epic delineation of events. Both have preserved some traditions of their oldest conditions. The Greek remained just as inclined to keep in the background the moment of the deed as the German rejoiced the picture of fighting and rapine, but if the Greek avoided violent physical efforts, blows, attacks, wrestling, overthrows, perhaps not the foresight of the poet, but the need of the actors was the ultimate reason. The Greek theater costume was very inconvenient for violent movements of the body. The falling of a dying person in the Cothernus must be gradual and very carefully managed if it would not be ridiculous, and the mask took away any possibility of representing the expression of the countenance indispensable in the moments of highest suspense. Gustav Freytag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 75. Yes, yes, because you can't tell how absolutely frustrated I am reading this without seeing my face. If you can't convey emotion without seeing the person's face, then why become a writer? Oh, the camera's working again? Oh, you can see my face? Oh, you must be able to read my emotions. Oh, oh, his quote is so wrong that I think my aunt and some of my previous literature teachers would have a field day with it. Where do we even start with this quote? As I said, he cites nothing except for his own ego, which is wrong. Let me read some facts about the dimensions of Greek theaters. Since he cited none, some ancient Greek theaters, such as the one at Ephesus, the diameter of which is 475 feet with a height of 100 feet. The stage itself was no puny thing either. The orchestra was about 60 feet, which is about 18 meters in diameter. The skein was 25 feet about 7.2 meters and 10 feet depth. Link is below. To give you an idea of how ridiculous that is to accuse them of not being able to move around or make violent scenes, let's look at a theater in Chicago. A modern stage in Chicago, the Atlas Neeson Theater is 52 feet, that's about 15.8 meters, with a total depth of 34 feet. Either way, the Greek stage is not that small. You could stage something like that. So the idea that they could not move around at all is laughable. God. <sighs> Freytag, did you actually try it out? Did you measure anything? Do you have any sources? No. And then the idea that their cothernus prevented them from moving around, which are just sandals. It's like putting on tibas. Said that it prevented them from doing any violent movements. Oh God. <laughs> no. Do you think that they didn't have like boots or anything? How did they conduct all of those wars? Athens and Sparta had all those wars and he thinks that 
they just couldn't do anything because they wore sandals. God. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> oh, but he has more. He has more. <sighs> okay, there were some things that he did get right, like furthering the description about putting characters as the center, though he was not the first. The first law, that of unity, admits of still another application to the characters. The drama must have only one chief hero, about all whom the person, however great their number, arrange themselves in different gradations. The drama has a thoroughly monarchic arrangement. The unity of its action is essentially dependent on this, that the action is perfected about one dominant character. But also for a sure effect, the first condition is that the interest of the spectator must be directed mostly towards one person and he must lean as early as possible who is to occupy his attention before all other characters. Since the highest dramatic processes but few persons can be exhibited in broad elaboration, the number of great roles is limited to a few and it is common experience that nothing is more painful to the hearer than the uncertainty as to what interests he should give to each of these important persons. It is also one practical advantage of the piece to direct its effects towards a single middle point. Whoever deviates from this fundamental law must also do so with the keen perception that he surrenders a great advantage, and if his subject matter makes the surrender necessary, he must in doubt ask himself whether the uncertainty thus arising in the effects will be counterbalanced by other dramatic advantages. Gustav Freitag, Dies Techniques des Dramas, page 304 to 305. He also said that if the emotions don't feel true to the audience, that there will be no connection. But he was an imperialistic donkey in the name of Christ. This was because Gustav Freytag liked to regularly talk about how he was superior to Shakespeare. This is one of his many examples. Look, I am not the biggest fan of Shakespeare. But the ego on Freytag, you've got to be kidding me. Not watching Shakespeare at the Globe Theater is a travesty, but Gustav Freytag is 10 times worse. Oh, I can't believe you, dude. What the hell is Gustav Freytag thinking that he can improve Hamlet? Does he have a TARDIS like David Tennant and then found out that he's really an imp from the beginning of time? Dear Freytag, you were not born in the time of William Shakespeare. He does not know that you exist. Your sperm that fertilized your egg does not exist. So what the f is up with you? And yet your ego is big enough so you think that William Shakespeare should have used your story structure when you do not even exist yet. And then you go after one of his best loved plays to say that you could have done it better. Okay, you might be thinking, uh, it's the only time we should let him slide. Oh no, 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 no. He got Shakespeare and Aristotle wrong so many times. By the time that I got through a third of the book, I wanted to scream. Please give me relief. I do not want to finish this book, but I had to. So content warning here. He's about to get very racist. 
for not out of the particularities of human life, but out of its immortal import, out of what is common to us and to the old times, blossom his successes. Still more he will avoid presenting such strange peoples as stand entirely outside the great forward movements of civilization, that which is unusual in their manner and customs, their costumes, or even the color of their skins is distracting and excites attendant images which are unfavorable and to serious art effects in a crude way. The ideal world of poetry is joined in the hearer's mind with a picturing of real circumstances which can claim an interest only because they are real. But even the inner life of such foreigners is unsuitable for dramatic expression, for without exception, the capability is in reality wanting them of presenting any fullness. The inner mental processes which our art finds necessary and the transferring of such a degree of culture into their souls rightly arouses in the hearer a feeling of impropriety. Anyone who would lay the scene of his action among the ancient Egyptians or the present day fellas among the Japanese or even Hindus would perhaps awaken ethnographic interests by the strange character of his people. But this interest of curiosity in the unusual would not increase for the hearer before the stage the real interest in what may be the poetical meaning, but would thwart it and prejudice it. It is no accident that such people are a fitting basis for the drama as have advanced so far in the development of their intellectual life that they themselves could produce a popular drama, Greeks, Romans, cultured people of modern times, after these a people nearly like them whose nationality has grown up with ours, or with the ancient culture, like the Hebrews, scarcely yet the Turks, how far the marvelous may be deemed worthy of the drama cannot be doubtful even to us Germans, upon whose stage the most spirited and most amiable of all devils has received citizenship. Dramatic poetry is poorer and richer than her sister's, lyric and epic in this respect, that she can represent only men, and if one looks more closely, only cultivated men. These, however, fully and profoundly, as no other art can, she must arrange historical relations by inventing for them an inner consistency which is thoroughly comprehensible to human understanding. How shall she embody the supernatural? But granted that she undertakes this, she can only do it in so far as the superhuman, already poetically prepared through the imagination of the people and provided with a personality corresponding to the human, is personifiable through sharply stamped features, even to details. Thus given form, the Greek gods lived in the Greek world among their people, thus hover among us still, fashioned with affection, images of many of the holy ones of Christian legend, almost numerous shadowy forms from the household faith of German primitive times. Gustav Freytag, Des Techniques des Dramas, page 54 to page 55. Excuse me while I try to analyze this mess that he's just said and I had to say in order to make this video and I'm sorry that I had to say those words. <sighs> in a condensed way, he's saying that all Indians are Hindus. That is wrong. If I were to talk about why it's wrong, I would have to invite own voices and then we would be talking about it until next month. Until the sun came back up. Cause it is that dark. And then he says that the ancient Egyptians weren't worth anything.
Okay. Who invented the paper that you're writing on? You cannot be a writer without paper. Gustav Freitag. Well, my gut. And then he says that the Turks and the Hebrews grew up side by side. And that is how the Hebrews, Jews, of which I am one because not all Jews are freaking white. I was adopted by some Jews. Handle it. Especially all of the people that made fun of me at all of those Jewish day camps. Okay? If you include all these people according to Gustav Freitag, you're only doing it for a curiosity. It's not because your audience could be, oh, I don't know, Japanese, Jewish, oh, Turkish. They couldn't possibly learn German. Oh, maybe there's some Egyptians in your audience. Is that why you wrote all that racist crap in your books, Gustav Freitag? And if that was not enough, he continues on and says that the Germans inherited from that great civilization. <sighs> the Greeks. Everybody else went to shit. Okay, as a Jew, I'm kind of obligated to mention other Jews. And in this case, he did marry a Jew much later. Though he still wrote a bunch of anti-Semitic crap. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the description box below. But don't you feel a little sad for his wife? He just said that her civilization is not good enough. Because the Turks helped lift her civilization off of the dirt. And even the Turks are not good enough to be in place. So, conclusion. People like to attribute that Gustav Freytag said things like this. Freytag's analysis revealed a structural pattern in Greek and Shakespearean dramas. He found that the parts of play fell into five consecutive components. Exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement. In a stage play, these parts often become the five acts that comprise the production. Freytag's Pyramid, Dramatic Structure and Story Arc by David Walton for Video Maker. How do you say that you've never read the book. Actually finish reading the text, and then read the paratext, and then want to stab him. Look, it's mostly his ego saying that he's better than either of them. But I understand if you don't want to read his entire book. To me, most of his book sounds like a Neanderthal has a hand axe. A modern person sees that the Neanderthal has a hand axe and asks, oh, why does that person have a stone hand axe? Why couldn't he have a steel hand axe ordered from Amazon? Maybe because Amazon does not exist? Even though Freytag's analysis applied primarily to ancient drama, the model can be implemented in the contemporary television and film. However, they rarely involve the clearly defined acts that Freytag's model describes. In fact, you'll find the model in everything from modern family to your favorite crime drama. You'll find opportunity for the purest form of Freytag's pyramid and a full length feature screenplay. Freytag's Pyramid, Dramatic Structure and Story Arc by David Walton for Video Maker. No, you do not find Freytag in modern dramas. Do not use Freytag. If you examine his story structure, 
then you find that it is comparable to male experiences of sex. Because don't you remember he said something like, after the deed is consummated, a pause ensues. He is literally comparing his story structure to his experiences of sex. But only cis men's experience of sex. He also goes on at various lengths about how Christianity is important. So he inserts Christian ideas into his story structure. If you notice his story structure, it has three sides, which is Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. So I would argue, unless you are a German who thinks that Shakespeare meant the Germans to inherit all of his plays and become great because it was a direct lineage from the Greeks to the Germans and the Germans are the pinnacle of all civilization and you hate Turks, Jews, Japanese, and Egyptians that you should probably not use this story structure. Oh, and if you hate ancient Egyptians, stop using paper. Stop writing books, stop using anything that is involved with paper. You should probably tear down your entire house because that was made with blueprints, which were originally made with paper. But then you would be homeless. And there's other inventions that the ancient Egyptians made besides paper. And they helped with mathematics and writing. Maybe you should just quit being a writer. Maybe you should quit living in civilization altogether. Also, if you are not a man, then Freytag's story structure is probably not for you. Because he explicitly said that it was his experience of sex and maybe you are not a man. History had revenge on Gustav Freytag. He was born July 13, 1816 in Kreuzberg, Silesia, Prussia. He died April 30th, 1895. So the revenge history got on Gustav Freytag is that the place that he's born is now Polish territory. <laughs> the place that he's born is now called Klutzburg, Poland. Hello Gustav Freytag! You are Polish! Welcome to the collapse of Prussia, Freytag! To Gustav Freytag in his grave. Witam Polak, Gentile. So while Freytag isn't directly used in later works, you can still feel his ghost hovering around. Ooh. This is most likely because Germans were thoroughly hated after World War I and World War II. So people kind of refer to him, but don't give him credit for any of his ideas. So join me in the next episode when we go over who got Aristotle completely wrong yet again and the start of all of those diagrams. And we might start tasting the beginnings of conflict? Nah. So subscribe and hit that bell or don't subscribe. Like or hate the video, but if you're going to debate in the comments, leave reliable, verifiable sources and be civil about disagreements. So read more, explore more, see more, love more literature. Let literature light up your world. See you next time.